The modern miracles of sound motion pictures and radio open up vast sources of entertainment and instruction. To benefit from these, we need our ears, which interpret for us the multitude of sound waves they receive. Now, if you will lend me your ears while watching this picture on the screen, I will tell you about these invisible waves and how our ears are able to convert them into sound. We all know that if a pebble is dropped into water, ring-like ripples spread in all directions over the surface. A doorbell ringing sends out similar but invisible wave-like impulses which travel through the air with a speed of about 1,100 feet per second. Sounds of every kind are transmitted to our ears by just such waves. Even now, as my voice comes to you, it is carried by these airwaves to be conveyed to your own brain by nerve impulses created within your ear. As we shall see, this feat of conversion requires the highly refined and perfect mechanism which is our ear. To begin with, air impulses are caught by the outer shell and directed into the air canal. Now let us look into this canal by using a specially designed instrument like this otoscope which is used by physicians when examining our ears. There in the center we see a small disc which is the drum membrane. Now here it is at very close range and very much enlarged. Sound waves beat against this membrane as drumsticks beat upon a kettle drum or tympanum. So it is naturally called the tympanic membrane. It lies a little more than an inch from the outer opening and completely shuts off the eardrum from the ear canal, just as a drum head completely covers a drum. Hidden immediately beyond this barrier lies the oddly shaped and highly specialized organ which by far surpasses any instrument of human invention in its ability to detect and to interpret sounds of every conceivable kind and degree. It is indeed rightly called the most remarkable mechanical system in the human body. And now let us examine the general position of this apparatus when seen from the front. Here is the ear canal and the more internal parts which have an outlet into the throat. The Eustachian tube. This important connecting passage opens just above the tonsil. Like other important sense organs, the ear lies close to the brain. All sound waves entering the ear are converted into nerve impulses. These impulses are conveyed to the brain by the auditory nerve, the shortest path to the auditory center, which controls the organ and where sound perception or hearing is located. The bones of the skull also encase the inner ear. Here we can see it occupying a group of intricate hollows and channels. These are safely protected within the hardest portion of the temporal bone. This portion is actually the hardest bony structure in the whole body. Now let us greatly enlarge the picture of one ear so that we may examine its construction and its parts in greater detail in this sectional view. The ear is divided into three parts. First, the external or outer ear, consisting of the shell or pinna, and the auditory canal or meatus. These and many of the parts that are to follow have been given their names because they resemble familiar objects. A second, the middle ear or eardrum, also called the tympanum consisting of the drum membrane, already compared to a drum head, and the drum cavity. This is shut away from the outer ear by the drum membrane, but communicates with the throat by means of the Eustachian tube, already mentioned. The most striking feature of the middle ear are these three tiny but delicately fashioned bones. They're called the ear bones, or ossicles. Like the outer ear, the middle ear contains air, it is the purpose of the Eustachian tube to equalize the air pressure on both sides of the drum membrane to prevent its being injured by violent noises or changes in air pressure. Beyond the middle ear lies the third part called the inner ear or labyrinth. Unlike the outer and the middle ear, this part is filled with a liquid instead of air and contains the delicate apparatus which transforms sound waves into nerve impulses. 
And now let's look at a still larger view of the middle ear with its three ear bones or ossicles. And then see what happens when sound waves strike the drum membrane. This bone, consisting of a head and handle, is called a hammer or malleus and is fastened by the handle to the drum membrane. United to the malleus by a joint is the anvil or incus, which in turn touches the stirrup or stapes. The foot plate of the stirrup is attached by a movable ligament to an opening, which is called the oval window. If from any cause the drum membrane is forced inward, its movement is transmitted to the stapes, and the upper part of its foot plate swings into the inner ear as on a hinge. Repeated pushes make the plate swing in and out, agitating the liquid which fills the inner ear. And now let's see how sound waves coming from a ringing bell act upon the ear mechanism. Here we see in slow motion how these sound waves, by beating against the drum membrane, are carried across the middle ear to the inner ear by the chain of ossicles. The inner ear or labyrinth contains the minute but extraordinary mechanism which finally converts sound waves into nerve impulses. If the eardrum should be destroyed, sound waves could still reach the inner ear through the surrounding bone and cause some sensation of hearing. But destruction of the labyrinth itself causes complete deafness. The labyrinth, as its name implies, consists of a maze of passages or tunnels hollowed out of the solid surrounding bone. These passages are loosely lined with a skin or membrane. Now if we remove its surrounding bone, we reveal the shape of the entire labyrinth as it is formed by its lining membrane. Part of the labyrinth consists of these three ring-shaped passages called the semicircular canals. These, however, only aid the body in keeping its balance and need not be considered in connection with hearing. Our real interest is in this rounded portion with the two small openings and, of course, the part with which it is united and which looks like the shell of a snail. Returning to our sectional view, we see that the rounded portion contains a hollow chamber lying between the middle ear and the snail. A number of openings lead to adjoining parts, just like doors do from a hallway. So it is called the vestibule. These openings in the vestibule lead to the semicircular canals. Actively related to the hearing mechanism are these two openings which have already been pointed out on the outside of the labyrinth and which allow sound waves to pass from the eardrum to the inner ear. The first of these openings is called the round window. It is covered by a very thin membrane. The second, the oval window. Through it I received sound impulses transmitted by the plate of the stapes which covers it. And the third opening leads into the upper half of the passage, which has the shape of a snail or cockle shell, and so is called the cochlea. Within the cochlea is contained the mechanism which finally converts sound vibrations into nerve impulses. Let us look at the inside of this amazing little instrument. If we were to slice through the middle of the cochlea and then turn the separated portion face upwards, we would see inside a spiral-shaped canal, which circles around a central core of bone called the modialis. This canal is divided into an upper and lower portion by a membrane shaped like a spiral ramp. This membrane is of a highly complicated internal construction and when agitated by sound waves, sends out nerve impulses. These are conducted to the brain by nerves which unite to form the main auditory nerve leading to the auditory center. Now let's look at a simple diagram of the cochlea and its action. And this time, let's take off the top. Here again briefly, we recognize the vestibule with the oval window covered by the stirrup. And directly below is the round window covered by its membrane. 
And here is the third opening, which leads directly into the inner channel of the cochlea. This white line represents the all-important spiral membrane, which transforms sound waves into the sensation of hearing. As we have seen before, this space is filled with a liquid. Now here again, we observe the action of sound waves upon the ear. This is merely a simple picture of the complicated action that results when sound waves enter the inner ear by way of drum and ear bones. The liquid, when set into vibration, causes wave-like shakings of the spiral membrane. These shakings, in turn, set up the nerve action, which, when carried to the brain, results in the sensation of hearing. The ear, then, is a very delicate and complicated mechanical device, astonishingly sensitive in its ability to separate and to distinguish a vast medley of sounds. It excels by far the most ingenious and delicate instruments ever devised by man.